Good day, I'm Brian Farrell, and welcome to Pace IT's session on basic forensic procedures. Today we're going to be discussing how to recognize the need for forensic procedures, and then we will conclude with some basic forensic concepts and procedures. There's a fair amount of ground to cover, so let's go ahead and begin this session. Of course, I'm going to begin by discussing how to recognize the need for forensic procedures. The first step in basic forensic is the recognition that forensic measures need to be taken, as in that a security incident has occurred. Most technicians, at least hopefully, will not need to deal with a murder mystery in the workplace. However, it is almost a certainty that they will have to deal with some type of security or legal issue, especially when supporting an organization's network. This will often require using a first response that includes forensic procedures. The response to security and legal issues needs to be done in a manner such that evidence is recorded and preserved. The first step is recognizing that something has occurred which needs to be documented and that evidence needs to be collected and preserved. With that, let's discuss some basic forensic concepts and procedures. Let's begin by discussing first responder responsibilities. The first item on any first responder's agenda is to secure the area and limit who has access to the area as much as possible. Do not power down computer systems at this time. Securing the area and limiting access is done to protect possible evidence from being contaminated. Document anyone who has access to the area after it has been secured. If necessary, at least to stop an ongoing computer attack, it is permissible to unplug the network cable. First responders need to document the scene thoroughly, including what is on any computer monitors. Video capture can be used to document the scene. Polaroid type pictures, not digital pictures, work well as evidence. It may also be necessary to diagram the area. The first responders should interview any witnesses as soon as possible. And finally, the first responders need to start the electronic evidence collection process by order of volatility. So let's discuss the order of evidence volatility. Electronic evidence is volatile and easily corruptible just because of what it is. So the order of collection is vital. And the collection process needs to be done from most volatile to least volatile. The most volatile of all electronic evidence is the contents of memory or the contents of RAM. There is software out there that will allow a first responder to dump the contents of RAM into a secure file to be collected as evidence. Next up are swap files. They're not as volatile as random access memory, but they're still very temporary in nature. Next up is network processes. All network processes that are active on the affected system or systems need to be recorded. And then the same needs to occur with system processes. Then there's file system information. This needs to be collected, including the attributes of all files. And finally, raw disk blocks. This is all of the contents on all of the disk drives of all of the affected systems. After isolating the affected system or systems from the network, a bit-level image of the system needs to be created. When creating the bit-level image, it is necessary to create the proper timestamps. Have the recording system match the time offset of the target system. It is necessary to create two copies of the bit-level image and to create a message digest of those images. This is to be able to prove later that the images have not been tampered with. One of the images should be securely stored and kept as evidence. The other image can be examined in detail. So there are two different types of system image. You can do a live system image or a static system image. With a live system image, this is capturing the system image before the system is powered down. This can be used to capture highly volatile evidence. There is a warning though, a live system image may change the target system's data structure. 
which will result in a change in the evidence. A static system image, on the other hand, is capturing a bit-level system image after the system is powered down. The hard drive or drives are removed from the system and connected to a forensic workstation with a write blocker placed between them. The write blocker prevents any changes from occurring on the target drive as its image is captured. All evidence requires a chain of custody. It's a document that identifies who collected the evidence, when it was collected, and who has had access to it since it was collected. A proper chain of custody document can prove that evidence has been accurately preserved and the chain of custody can also be considered as part of the evidence. A chain of custody document will help to ensure that all evidence is admissible in court. A broken chain of custody will negate the collected evidence. A first responder should create a tracking log. This documents all the steps taken from the beginning of the initial incident response all the way through the end. This tracking log can also show all the steps taken during the forensic process. It can be used to help track internal resources expended on the incidents as well. And these resources can include both man hours and other expenditures. This tracking log can also be used to justify expenses for management or clients. A type of forensic evidence that's often overlooked are network traffic files and log files. These create a history of events, which is a good source for determining what has occurred on a computer. Network traffic logs and browser history files can show where the system went on the internet and what actions were taken. Log files, as in system log files, application log, or security logs, can help to determine what has occurred with a system. And finally, there's big data analysis. There needs to be recognition that in some situations, big data analyst tools may be required. Big data in this situation refers to any set of data that is too large to analyze with typical data management tools. An example of this would be when analyzing data from a security incident at a financial institution. This can involve multiple exabytes of data. Now that concludes this session on basic forensic procedures. I began by discussing how to recognize the need for forensic procedures, and then I concluded with a brief discussion on basic forensic concepts and procedures. On behalf of PACE IT, thank you for watching this session, and I hope to do another one soon.